Hello internet users and welcome back to another video. After spending a lot of time with the first Mega Man game, I wanted to jump right into the next one. Mega Man 2 is without a doubt one of the most iconic games on the NES, and like I mentioned last time, it also holds the record for being the most successful Mega Man game ever released. If this game didn't do as well as it did, we probably wouldn't have had nearly as many sequels and spin-offs as we do today. The importance of this game should not be understated. With that said, you might find it surprising to hear that this game almost didn't even happen. After the release of the first game, the higher-ups at Capcom had no interest in releasing any more. It wasn't considered very successful, so continuing it as a series didn't seem like something worth pursuing. However, the small team behind Mega Man 1 believed in the potential of a sequel, and were pretty much willing to do whatever they could to get the project approved. With some convincing, director Akira Kitamura managed to get the go-ahead from Capcom. However, they only agreed to it on the condition that the game could only be worked on between other projects. In other words, Mega Man 2 had to be developed during the team's spare time, and even under these circumstances, the game would still have a strict deadline. From the very start, Mega Man 2 seemed like it was a guaranteed disaster. The fact that it went on to become such a smash hit is a testament to how passionate the team was to make the game they wanted to make, and in doing so, they proved to Capcom that this was a series worth investing into. And then Mega Man 3 got rushed to release, but that's another rant for another video. Anyways, the main thing I'm here to talk about is how Mega Man 2 holds up compared to its predecessor, so let's finally get into it. The game opens up with an intro screen telling us the story. After the events of the previous game, Dr. Wily has created eight robots of his own in order to defeat Mega Man. Pretty straightforward and to the point, I'm sure we all know this game was never famous for the plot. Right off the bat, you can see that one of the things improved here is the presentation. Mega Man 1's title screen was pretty simplistic, but here in the new game, we see the camera pan to the top of a building. Then the title graphic arrives, and you're given a choice of difficulty. Once you select something, he gears up, ready to jump into action. Not only is this a major step up from before, but in general, it's a really cool title screen for 1988. Many would say that it's even one of the most iconic of this era. Continuing into the boss selection, we can see even more improvements. You have all eight of the Robot Masters laid out in a square, with a close-up of their faces. Mega Man 1's screen did its job just fine, but I definitely prefer the bosses having dedicated portraits, instead of just using their in-game sprites. There's also now a little message screen after you clear a stage, which tells you the name of the power you just earned for clearing it. And while we're on the subject of bosses, let me introduce all these guys. The Robot Masters of this game are Flashman, Airman, Woodman, Crashman, Quick Man, Metal Man, Bubble Man, and Heat Man. While before there were only six Robot Masters, Mega Man 2 starts the tradition of every game having eight of them. Not only that, but these are also the first group of bosses that were designed by fans. You see, for many of the classic Mega Man games, Capcom would hold a contest where fans submitted their ideas for bosses. The eight chosen winners would have their ideas reworked in order for it to fit in with everything else in the game. I'm sure many people have heard of this before, but one thing that might surprise you was how the winners of the contest were decided. Since Mega Man 2 still had a deadline to meet, the devs obviously had to begin working on the game before they received any submissions. Instead of designing stages around a robot master, they would instead create differently themed areas and then later choose a submission that would reasonably fit there. For example, when you have a water level and a forest level, it would make sense to choose ideas like Bubble Man and Wood Man to go there. However, not everything was going to be a perfect match. In some cases, it seems like some stages were even given slight visual changes to better fit whatever boss was assigned to it. If you look at Flashman's level, it's very clear that this was originally meant for an ice-themed character. All of the surfaces have ice physics, and all of the blocks could easily pass as blocks of ice, assuming that's not what they're supposed to be anymore. I guess the logic here is that Flashman's ability freezes time, so they gave him the ice level. I don't know. Another one that I think was changed was Heat Man stage. This whole area is clearly a sewer, and that's not really the sort of place you'd put a fire-themed boss. I get the impression that they had nowhere else to put this guy, so they just made this place really red, and just said that the sewer water was now lava. This isn't really a complaint, I just find it interesting to think about, knowing that the stages were being made before the Robot Masters. Overall though, I do think that all the bosses have great levels. There's a lot of variety when it comes to the enemies and layout. Even if the design process seems kind of backwards, I would say that every stage ended up with a lot more personality than the last game. Mega Man 1's levels weren't bad looking, but they definitely look a little simpler 
simplistic in comparison. I think it's mainly because of the backgrounds. Before, most of them were just a single color sky 90% of the time. In fact, looking back on the footage, I realized that Iceman had the only stage with clouds in the background. Mega Man 2 has some simple backgrounds as well, but for most of the game, there's a lot more going on. But moving on, I think it's time I talked about some of the gameplay changes. Mega Man 2 makes a good impression with the visuals, but there is a lot more to go over. For starters, a pretty noticeable change is that they got rid of the score system. While that might seem like such a minor thing, it's definitely nice to no longer have point items mixed into the pool of enemy drops. I've given my thoughts about it before, but I think that points were a completely useless mechanic in the first game. They were too random for any high scores to be competitive, and there was no benefit to earning a lot of them. You couldn't even get an extra life by reaching a certain amount. Another addition to the sequel is the E-Tanks. Throughout the levels, you can find these tanks in various places. By opening up the weapon menu, you can use one that you've picked up to restore Mega Man's health to full. It should be noted, though, that you can only carry a maximum of four at a time. As well, if you run out of lives in Game Over, you'll lose all of them. Game Overs weren't very punishing before, because the levels always felt short even when you're sent back to the beginning. The same applies here in Mega Man 2, so now the main reason to hang on to your lives is to protect your E-Tanks, so you'll have them for the most difficult parts. By the way, even if you're at full health, the game will still let you use them, so be careful when you're going through the menu. Another much needed improvement was the inclusion of a password system. With this, you now had a way of turning off the console without having to replay from the beginning every single time. Obviously, if you're you're playing this on a modern release like the Legacy Collection, you're likely just going to use the built-in save feature, but it's still important to acknowledge how much of a difference this made back when it first released. The next thing I want to mention is the difficulty selection. While this is a new feature, something you need to keep in mind is that this wasn't in the original release. What is referred to as difficult mode is just how the game is in the Japanese version. The normal mode was something added to the English version, which made many elements of the game much easier. This decision was likely a response to all the people saying that Mega Man 1 was too difficult. In my opinion, normal mode is not a very balanced experience. I'll be sure to point out some of the smaller changes as we go along, but generally, regular enemies have half as much HP and also have a highly increased drop rate. A couple of enemies, like this stack of blocks here, behave differently depending on which mode you're playing. When it comes to the bosses, all of the damage they receive is doubled. And this is the main issue I have with this mode. It's one thing when a buster shot does 2 damage instead of 1, but when a weapon does 20 damage instead of 10, you can start to see how just doubling every value isn't a well thought out idea. As I go over this game, most of my criticisms are going to be focusing on how it's presented in difficult mode. Again, this is because it's the original way Mega Man 2 was designed, so it makes the most sense to examine it that way. There's nothing wrong with only wanting to play on normal mode though, so don't think I'm trying to imply that difficult is the only real way to play the game or anything like that. Anyways, let's get back to the topic of the Robot Masters. With 8 stages that can be played in any order, the game has a good amount of variety. Bubble Man Stage is a water-themed one, where your movement and jumping is altered when you're underwater. Metal Man Stage is a factory where the floors have conveyor belts. Air Man Stage takes place high up in the clouds with all kinds of ways to fall to your death. Crash Man Stage is a long climb up some elevators and ladders. Flash Man Stage is, like I said before, the Ice Stage. That's pretty much the only way to describe it. Quick Man Stage is all about being fast to avoid these lasers that fill the rooms you enter. Wood Man Stage is a forest with lots of animal-themed robots. And finally, Heat Man Stage has a focus on platforming across disappearing blocks. Like before, as you gain more abilities from defeated bosses, you'll have more options for dealing with the next one you go into. How do these eight new abilities work? Well, let's start by talking about a very useful one, the Metal Blades. I'm sure everybody was waiting for me to talk about this. The Metal Blades are without a doubt the most overpowered ability in Mega Man 2. You can throw them in eight directions, and they're good for destroying almost every regular enemy in the game. They go through walls, cost almost no energy, and most of the time, there isn't a downside to spamming them like it's your basic attack. And as if that wasn't enough, there are actually three bosses in the game that have Metal Blades as a weakness. Bubble Man, Flash Man, and Metal Man. Yeah, that's right, Metal Man's power is so good that even he can't stand up against it. Of course, though, this only applies to the boss refights at the end of the Wily Fortress. 
According to the game's director, Kitamura, this was meant to be a fun secret for gaming magazines to talk about. During the planning stages of development, they wanted to include something like this so it could possibly lead to the game getting more coverage and attention. Knowing how good this attack is, it's not surprising that Metal Man is the most popular choice for playing first. Even though his fight can look intimidating with the moving floor, it's actually really easy. You just stay on your side of the screen, focus on jumping over the blades, and shoot between his throws. Even if you have trouble here, this stage has an E-Tank at the start. It's just out in the open and requires no effort to get. Now, the other weapons do have their uses, but there are a lot of times where it's just going to be faster and more efficient to use the Metal Blades. They're a simple but very effective attack in most situations. The next ability I'll talk about is Woodman's. This attack is known as the Leaf Shield. By using it, Mega Man will surround himself with leaves. However, if you press any direction on the D-pad, the entire shield will be sent that way, so you can't use it to absorb enemy attacks while platforming, only while standing still. The name is also a little bit misleading, as it can barely be called a shield. Even if you have it up, most projectiles will still hit you anyway. The best use of this attack is when you're fighting Airman. It's his weakness, and he takes a massive 8 points of damage from each attack. Having the Leaf Shield here trivializes the fight, no matter which difficulty you're playing. However, every other boss in the game is completely immune to this attack. In the case of the regular enemies though, there are a few situations you can use it. There's this enemy that moves along the ground. It happens to be immune to both the Buster and the Blades. A couple other weapons can damage it, but the shield can get rid of it with one attack. Another example is this robot here. When you attack it with most weapons, its shell will fly off. But if you use the leaves, it'll destroy it immediately. There are also a few hallways in the game that have these drill enemies coming out of the floor and ceiling. The leaves are the quickest way to clear them out, so you can move forward while they continuously spawn. The next power is Bubble Man's weapon, Bubble Lead. This sends out a bubble that travels along the floor. It's the weakness of Heat Man and a few bosses that appear later on. Other than that, there's also one part in the game where you can use it to reveal hidden holes in the ground. Round. That's pretty much it, sadly. It's an attack that doesn't see much use outside of those key parts. Airman's power is the air shooter. This one sends out a blast of three tornadoes that travel upward. This attack is Crash Man's weakness, and it destroys him in a few hits. It's also the weakness of Woodman. You can also use this attack to quickly destroy the machines that the Sniper Joes are controlling. When you beat Crash Man, you'll get the Crash Bomber. Throughout the game, there are these blocks that seal off shortcuts or extra items. The only way to destroy them is to use this attack. Because the Crash Bomber is so limited with its uses though, you'll always want to save it for the blocks, and you'll likely avoid wasting it on enemies. There is one boss in the Wily stages that you'll need to use it on, but don't worry, we'll talk more about that later. Flashman's ability is the Time Stopper. Like the name implies, it temporarily stops time. It's not as good as it sounds though. When you activate it, you can't turn it off until it completely runs out of energy. During this time, you can't switch to any other attack, and all frozen enemies will still give contact damage. The only thing it's really used for is Quick Man Stage. Stopping time here allows you to move past the lasers a little more safely. However, with how fast the energy drains, you won't have enough to last the entire section, so I'd recommend just saving it for the later parts. Other than that, the Flash Stopper also damages Quick Man. I guess the weakness logic is that Quick Man is so fast that being forced to stop actually hurts him. I suppose it had to be somebody's weakness, because every other boss takes no damage from it. Heat Man's ability is Atomic Fire. I frequently forget this one is even in the game, because I never use it. This one allows you to hold the button to charge a blast of fire, with up to three levels of power. It technically does the most damage to Woodman, but only when it's fully charged. Charging takes time, and even from a full meter, you can only get two fully charged shots from it. Because of that, it's not worth messing around with. Pretty much anything else is going to be faster and cost less energy. After several playthroughs though, I did find one spot that I can actually use Atomic Fire for. During one of the final stages, there is a passage with a low ceiling that has a Sniper Joe waiting at the end. Because he can't jump over his shots here, it seems impossible to avoid damage. But if you know about him ahead of time, you can have a charged blast ready to take him out as he appears on screen. And that's it. That's the one and only time I use this. When you defeat Quick Man, you gain the Quick Boomerang. The Boomerangs are the weakness of Metal Man. As I've said before, he's already pretty easy when you have no abilities at all, but the fight definitely is much faster if you have this one. This weapon is kind of bad. It's a pretty generic attack that doesn't do much damage to most enemies. The Metal Blades pretty much do the same thing, but much better. There are a couple bosses at the end that it's a good option for, but that's only because they're immune to the Blades. 
At this point, I have to say, it's kind of painful to try and describe the abilities of this game. It's commonly said that the Metal Blades are so good that they make all of the other attacks obsolete. And while I do think that's true to an extent, especially for the boomerangs, the main problem is that the game doesn't have many places outside of the boss rooms where they can be all that useful. Part of the appeal of Mega Man 1 was replaying it several times and facing the bosses in a different order. Even if you're not following the weaknesses, the levels and enemy placement allowed you to experiment with what you had and approach the enemies in different ways. Every playthrough, I felt like I was learning something new about the game and appreciated it even more. But here in Mega Man 2, I wasn't getting much of that feeling this time. It was refreshing to do playthroughs where I play Metal Man last, but even then, a lot of the weapons still didn't feel worth using in most situations. Surprisingly, while making this video, I actually learned that there's a reason why the game ended up this way. In a 2011 interview, the director of the first two Mega Man games, Akira Kitamura, revealed some details about the second game's development. The enemies and weapons are the core of Mega Man, so we thought about them a lot. Unfortunately, Mega Man 1 and Mega Man 2 really have a lot of rough spots. In Mega Man 2 especially, we truly had no time. We hardly spent any time fine-tuning and polishing the bosses. Normally, we'd do a lot of playtesting, trying out all the weapons in different places, but in Mega Man 2, we didn't do anything. Once something was finished, we checked that it worked, and that was that. If we hadn't done it like that, we never would have made the deadline. Mega Man 2 received a ton of critical praise, but on the other side, there are some people who think it's rough and flat. I understand why they think that. Knowing the circumstances of how development started, it's not that surprising to hear that time constraints were the biggest issue for balancing the weapons. However, despite this, they still managed to add something that fixed a massive problem problem I had with Mega Man 1. In this game, there are three items that you can pick up along the way. By using them effectively, you can quickly skip past difficult or tedious platforming sections. Item 1 creates a rising platform in front of you. Item 2 is a rocket that you can ride across certain obstacles. And item 3 is another rising platform that latches into walls. These are essentially the successor of Mega Man 1's Magnet Beam. Except this time, instead of having just one overpowered item that's useful everywhere, you can now get three individual items that are more limited to where they can help. None of these are mandatory for completing any of the Robot Master stages. However, there are plenty of parts in the Wily Fortress where they're the only way to progress. One of my biggest criticisms of the last game was the fact that the beam was a missable item. Because of that, it was possible to go all the way to the end of the first Wily stage and just not be able to do anything. An unfortunate situation that's pretty infamous for making people just quit then and there. Mega Man 2 fixes this by making the three items impossible to miss. Each of them are earned by defeating Heat Man, Air Man, and Flash Man. Upon completing their stages, Dr. Light will give you a message saying that the item is now ready to use and it will be added to your inventory automatically. With all of that being said though, I found that the items didn't influence the order of the stages very much for me. After multiple playthroughs, it is fun to discover where you can use them to speed up certain rooms, but these are usually such minor time saves that they're often equaled out by the time it takes you to pause and switch to the item. The only real exception to this is having item 2 in Heat Man stage. There's this one part where you have to jump across a hole with disappearing blocks, but you can just skip past all of it if you have item 2. No one will blame you for doing this. I don't think anybody actually likes playing this part without the rocket. Now after going over all of that, I think it's time to start talking about the Wily stages of this game. When all eight Robot Masters are defeated, Dr. Wily's Fortress becomes available, with six more stages that need to be beaten. Something that I need to emphasize for this video is that the footage I show of the upcoming bosses is going to look a little weird. The reason for this is because all of them have very irritating flashing effects when they take damage. So I'm gonna be editing around this so this part of the video doesn't give everyone a headache to watch. And to get right to the point, I have a lot of issues with the final stages. It really starts to become obvious that they were running out of time at this point, and this part of the game feels more unpolished the further you get to the end. I will say that the first few stages are pretty good though. For example, I like the look of the Mecha Dragon and the Guts Tank, the opening parts has the really iconic music, and a detail that I really like is how between each stage, you get to see a map screen that shows you how much progress you're making. But once you get to the second half, things start to get pretty obnoxious. Wily Stage 4 is without a doubt the worst Mega Man stage I've played so far, and the main reason for that is the boss. 
In the last room, there are these machines on the wall that fire lasers at you. However, they are immune to almost every single weapon in the game except the Crash Bomber. And as you can see, the room is also filled with the blocks that can only be destroyed with this ability. So what's the problem? Well, from a full meter, the Crash Bomber can only be used seven times. So this means that most of these blocks are a distraction that are meant to waste your energy. And once you run out, that's it. There's no way to replenish any of it, and you're forced to just stand there until you eventually die. And the best part? The last checkpoint in this stage is all the way back at the start of this long elevator section. You have to stand around just waiting until you can try again. All of the Wily stages are also terrible for refilling your energy. A lot of the enemies are placed in ways that makes them difficult to farm for drops. This is especially true in this stage, with all of the elevators and instant death spikes. However, I eventually did discover one awkward spot to do this, and needless to say, it's not very fun to play like this. Of course, another way to refill the Crash Bomber is to take an intentional game over, but doing so would cost you whatever E-Tanks you have left. This boss perfectly showcases all of my problems with Mega Man 2's weapons. When you have an obstacle that can only be cleared with one specific ability, you're setting the player up to get punished for experimenting with all of them. And different weapons have different levels of effectiveness on the game's enemies. If you try testing the Crash Bomber on anything here, then you just don't get to play when you get to the end. And looking at it in a different way, if you do know that you'll need a full meter later on, then you're just not going to use it. At that point, it doesn't matter if it's good against enemies or not. It's just a dead item in your inventory that you have to save for one part. As for the fight itself, it's also infuriating how you can have a full list of abilities, but none of them can do anything. They put all of these things in the game, but there's so many design choices that either won't let you use them, or heavily discourage you from using them. Like the director said, they only had time to make sure these abilities worked, and that was that. And the more I play this game, the more that becomes very apparent. Moving on, the next stage is the boss rush. It's a tradition in Mega Man games to have to refight all of the robot masters at the very end. In Mega Man 1, the bosses would appear along the way, and you'd have to defeat them in a set order. Mega Man 2 changes this up, and instead puts in a room with 8 capsules. Each one will teleport you to one of the robot masters, and you can't leave the room until they're defeated. That might sound pretty brutal, but this time around, when you beat one, they'll drop a health item. I'd still recommend trying to save some E-Tanks for this part, but it's not too bad as long as you know what the weaknesses are. When they're all taken care of, a final capsule will appear in the hub room, and it'll take you to Dr. Wily. Here, he uses a new version of his machine from the last game. There are two phases. The first one isn't so bad, you just jump over and attack. The second phase is a bit strange though. It seems like it's impossible to avoid taking damage here. All you do is just spam your attacks before you run out of health. Apparently this part is pretty infamous among the crowd who go for no damage or buster only playthroughs. I should mention though that you can actually clear this phase with a single crash bomb. If you still have one, that is. When Wily's beaten, you fall down into the game's final stage. Really though, it's just a short hallway that leads to a boss. Fun fact, you can actually just hold right while you're falling down the hole and completely avoid whatever these little attacks are. Dr. Wily transforms into a space alien and then floats around, firing projectiles at you. This boss manages to be both very easy and also very annoying. The only attack that affects him is the bubble lead. If you hit him with anything else, it restores his health to full. Yeah. They really did do that. Now, the pattern is very simple, and the attacks are very easy to dodge. It's just a matter of if you have enough bubbles when you arrive. There's no way to restore your energy in this area except by getting a game over. If you happen to use too much of the bubble lead during the boss rush, well then you have no choice but to stand around, waiting for your lives to run out. This is the end of the game, it's just you and the final boss. Why is this even set up in a way where it can massively waste your time? There were so many things they could have done here that would have made this far less awkward. In fact, this is something Mega Man 1 already figured out. Right outside of the door of the final boss, there's a large energy refill, and it respawns between every life. Not only that, but in that game, the final boss can still be damaged with the buster if you run out of energy. You always have a fighting chance, even if that last option was very weak compared to everything else. Again, it's not difficult when you know what to do, it's just how it's set up that just really makes me annoyed. When you land the final hit, it's revealed that the alien was just a hologram being controlled by Dr. Wily. With that, he's finally defeated and the ending plays. There isn't much for me to talk about here, there's no dialogue, and Mega Man walks forward while the seasons change. It then shows a final shot of his helmet sitting on a hill filled with flowers. 
And that about does it for Mega Man 2. To conclude, I think it's a pretty okay sequel, but it has a lot of issues. It improves a fair amount and adds things that the first game needed. However, there were also plenty of things that felt like a step backwards to me. While there are more abilities, there's much less to do with them, so the whole mechanic isn't nearly as strong as it was before. As for the difficulty, I'd say that overall, it's a little easier than the last game. Normal mode is a good way for most people to jump in, learn the stages, and be able to finish it. However, because of how wildly different the damage values are against bosses, that aspect of the game can feel underwhelming at times. But no matter which mode you play, there are a few parts here and there that will be pretty frustrating. The boss in Wily Stage 4 is the biggest example of this. It's not fun in either mode. I think Mega Man 2 is a game that's easy to be critical of. It clearly has so much going for it, and it's not hard to see the places where it could have been improved. It clearly had a lot of love put into it, but as we know now, the devs weren't able to polish it as much as they would have liked. Regardless of what I think though, there's no denying that this game's success is the whole reason we even have a Mega Man series after this game. And because of that, I've still got a long list of Mega Man games to cover. My name is Picaspri, and thanks for watching. Hey everybody, thanks for watching this video. It took a while to get this one done, life kept getting in the way, but I'm pretty happy with how this one turned out. If you want to see more, I guess you can subscribe, and if you want to see me stream, you can check the description about that below. Have a good night, Bye bye